Bob, you, you brought up, you know, the, the generational differences, um, you know, within less than five years, millennials are going to make up the vast majority of the workforce. So in your opinion and in your work with customers, how much is the change in workforce demographics driving the need to create intelligent buildings? Oh, it absolutely is. There, there's no question about that. And, you know, to look at that in the enterprise space or the office space, I think we need to step back and look at our residential space. Yeah. Now, it's so um, mainstream to have uh, some sort of building automation device at your house, whether it's a Smart Things Hub, an Alexa, or any of the, the multiple name brands that are out there. And, you know, the millennials are um, not only adopting it, but they're pushing it forward with greater demands. And if they can do this at home, if I can simply say, hey, make me a cup of coffee, and I walk downstairs and my coffee's ready, that's going to be demanded in the workspace. And it may not be about a cup of coffee, but it may be about the fact that, you know, I don't want to sit at my cubicle today. I want to work from Starbucks, but I need to have all my productivity tools. And to the outside world, it has to look like I'm sitting at my cubicle. So this type of functionality, this type of comfort in the workplace is really um, – just expected to be there, especially as the, the younger generations are now coming into the workforce. And we break down the demographics. Uh, what I find to be uh, very interesting when we look at the science of it is that baby boomer generation that is now the leaders of, um, of the business world, you know, they've acquired this technology as, as they've gone through life. And they use it when, um, when it makes their life easier, right? When it becomes a convenience. A smartphone is now a convenience tool more than anything else, but most of our baby boomers would be just as happy with uh, the, the corded wall phone and the uh, old-fashioned um, answering machine. Reliable. Reliable. <laughs> exactly. You know, then we move into the Gen Xs who have really assimilated and taken that technology and ingrained it into our lives, but we have to work at that. Now we have uh, the millennials and, uh, and the Gen Zs who are born with it. You, they don't remember a microwave being invented. <laughs> so this technology was just there from day one, um, and it is expected to be in all aspects of their lives. Yeah, I, um, I, I totally agree with that, Bob, and I, I think it's, it's really interesting to see um, the change in dynamic with you know, enterprise customers, institutional customers, un understanding that um, how the, the workforce is changing, how they need to adapt to, to those preferences, and I think you know, there is a leap that needs to be taken on the technology side in order to really make that impactful. I, there was an article, uh, I think, in the New York Times a few days ago about how Alexa could be the third great computing platform. You know, we have iOS, we have Android, and now we could have Alexa. And if you think about to what you just mentioned, how prevalent iOS and Android are, if Alexa, a voice assistant, you know, is that prevalent as a computing platform, just like we see iPhone, uh, iOS and Android in the workplace now, we certainly should expect to see something like Alexa, that type of intelligence in the workplace, right? I mean, that, that, that should be something we should. And I think we're there at the, at least at the beginning, you know, we look at Watson um, and that's really an enterprise Alexa. Yeah, good point. <laughs> on, uh, you know, incredibly beefed up, of course, with the power we need in the enterprise space. Um, and another little bit when we talk about uh, work, workspace experience and the, the younger generations, um, I think something we don't look at enough is how is uh, the entertainment world affecting that? Yeah. Going Movies, things like that, you know, I mean, um, I think of even comedies uh, like the, um, the Vince Vaughn movie about uh, being the intern at Google. You right. know, we're seeing what that work experience should be like. And while not everyone can work for Google, companies really need to be looking at how do we create that Google-esque experience in our organization so that we attract that top talent and we retain that top talent. So Bob, how, how difficult is it to create this experience? Right? I think that that's, you know, to go back to the question, you know, that I was asked by a customer. Sure. Where people are trying to grapple with, what do I need to create? But then how difficult is it to create that. And so what, what, what insight can you offer on, on what that means to create this type of experience, you know, yeah, inside of an intelligent building? So different degrees of that experience are going to be more difficult than others. And what I would suggest to anybody right now in today's market, in today's uh, where the um, technology is today is lay the platform. You don't have to be Google in a day. 
But if we have the infrastructure correct, and, and I do mean that from the physical infrastructure layer, right. uh, then we can build upon that, whether we're implementing all the sensors that we can today or integrating all the systems. If you don't have that infrastructure day one, you never will be able to. And buildings now, right, we're, we're building with 50 to 100 year life expectancies out of a building. You don't get a redo when it comes to your basic infrastructure. Um, when we do that, we then have the ability, the ability to digitize the building. And that, that's what I like to tell my customers is, hey, we want your building to be nothing but ones and zeros. And when we do that, it gives us the ability to manipulate that data to create whatever experience we want. You know, we're limited by two things. One is your imagination and creativity. The other is your ability to code. And it's much easier to find someone who can code than it is to find the creative people to figure out, hey, how can we leverage the vast amounts of data that we're finally capable of getting out of buildings to create the experience um, result in the better productivity and the happier workforce. Yeah, great point, Bob. You know, something that we uh, uh, are talking to a lot of our customers and, and, you know, our peers in the design community about is that you know, the network is really the fourth utility right, yeah. in today's world. You know, it's equally as important as electricity and, and HVAC and water. And you could even argue that you could possibly work without electricity, but you can't work without network. Right. You know, and, and to your point, that, that laying that foundational infrastructure and planning for it appropriately, I think, is so critical. And if people want to take that first step, they have to think about the network planning aspect to that, that they're getting that physical infrastructure in place. Um, you know, you, you mentioned a little bit about productivity. And I think that's another question we're hearing a lot is, you know, does this make my employees more productive or do they just like it better? And maybe those things are, are positively correlated, but what do we know about, uh, about the improvement in productivity as a result of having an intelligent building? So we talk about that engaged experience or that um, experience in the building and studies have actually shown that disengaged employees in an organization cost up to $3,500 a year per 10,000 in salary. Wow. So when we look at that experience factor and we look at the productivity models, the ability to get people engaged by giving them that experience, um, it really hits that bottom line of productivity just in that statistic alone. Yeah, amazing. You know, I think it's, it's, it's important to continue to hear, you know, that, that real dollar value cost to, to what it means to have engaged employees. And, and when we go back to thinking about the millennial workforce, you know, and the amount of uh, different types of devices we have to distract us, you know, an engaged employee in the workplace is, is really important. So um, that, that's a great statistic. Bob. If I can adjust my temperature or lighting just a little bit to make me more comfortable, I'm just inherently more productive. I don't even have to try. If I'm, if I'm uncomfortable, I'm going to get less done. Um, and certainly there's uh, plenty of data out there to show that intelligent buildings tend to be healthier buildings. And if you are healthier as an occupant, whether you work harder or not, or more productive or not, if you're calling in sick less often, you're going to get more work done. Right. Certainly, if you're happier in your environment, you're going to have less turnover. And I think that's the biggest drop in productivity when you think of that um, hiring cycle that could take up to three months uh, of lost productivity until that position's backfilled. So th there's certainly logic that can be applied. And I think um, that data will be following soon as people are really trying to understand that. Another thing I'll just want to feel my, I'll just mention on that is um, I actually consider the productivity to be uh, the cherry on the Sunday, so to speak, because mm -hmm. we have, uh, we're in such a unique position now where the economics of an intelligent building have flip flopped where they were uh, five, six years ago, where we can actually build intelligent buildings less expensively than you can your traditional building. So even if you don't buy into the uh, productivity model, that in even the experience model, the fact that you can build your buildings for up to $2 million less per 100,000 square feet and then risk the productivity numbers <laughs> coming right. to fruition, you know, it's kind of a good deal. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, Bob, and I'm excited to talk into, about some of those economics as well. Um, you know, I, I wanted to ask, I, I like how you use the anecdotal experience to that. And I think when we just think about our workforce, our peers, we can understand and I think building owners understand the greatest cost to them is their people inside of a building. It's not the electricity to run it. It's not the real estate. It's, it's the overhead, you know, the people sitting in that room, their, their salary and their cost. And um, I heard a great story about 
a bunch of really smart engineers at a technology company walking around trying to find a conference room. And after 45 minutes, they just gave up. So not only are we losing 45 minutes, but I thought the most interesting thing that the, the CTO said was, yeah, we lost 45 minutes. I'm not worried about that. I'm worried about the $10 million idea. We, we might have games if they were able to sit down and collaborate. So yeah. I think that that, uh, you know, that's a really impactful story, I think, when you, when you think about it from that perspective. Did you know that over 35% of conference room reservations go unused? I did not know that. That's yeah. <laughs> so, next time you see that CTO, let them know. Here we go. <laughs>